Hi, I'm Sam Ballaton Crimes. And I'm Alice Bellet. In this episode of Welcome, I take us to Kibra, one of the most famous informal settlements in Africa, where we meet the minority ethnic Nubian community. I confess, I'd never heard of the Nubians before I met you. Yeah, I do get that a lot when I'm outside of Kenya. But their story is really fascinating. They were bought by the British as soldiers from Sudan and more or less abandoned in Kenya. And this kind of thing actually happened quite a lot in colonial contexts. Colonial authorities would pick people up, move them around, mostly for labour, but also sometimes for war. And now the Nubians and other people in those situations, they have to really work to feel that they belong in Kenya in this case. Wow, that sounds like a really good example of how people still feel the effects of colonialism. Yeah, it really, really does. It's such a concrete case of having serious claims to make on the British, to hold them responsible for the challenges the community faces today. But it's also got some other layers too. Life was actually quite a lot better for the Nubians under the British, and that adds some complication. Yeah, I can imagine. So they want to go back to the colonial period? No, that's definitely not what they want. But they do have some pretty ambivalent feelings toward the British and what they're owed. Feelings that I would guess also exist in other parts of the British Empire. Yeah, like here for example. Yeah, exactly. So let's hear from some Nubians to tell us some more. I'm Talib Mohammed. Right now we are in the area that we used to call Kichinjo. Kichinjo means a slaughter place. Right across me, there is the Royal Golf Club. It used to be part of the 4,197.9 acres of the Nubian land. Twalib and I are in the neighbourhood of Kibra in Nairobi, the capital of Kenya. Kitchen Gio, the slaughter place, is one of the many places in Kibra that is important to the minority ethnic Nubian community to which Twalib belongs. When the Nubians were the only ones living here, this is where the butchers would slaughter animals and cut up halal meat. Twalib is the youngest member of the Kenya Nubian Council of Elders. Okay, the golf course, uh, it used to be used for golf by the European, and also the Nubian were also part of the... who used to play golf. So it was uh, part of the military reserve that was... uh, a long time uh, demarcated in, I think, in 1912 and uh, gazetted uh, in 1918. So it's part of the Kibra, the old Kibra that the Nubians still believe is part of their land. The Nubians were soldiers for the British, and this prime land in the middle of what became the capital city was a military reserve where the soldiers lived with their families. Sometimes they played golf with their British bosses, but more often they carried their gear. Behind us are the houses that partly belong to the Nubians and uh, you can see the vegetation are not around this side. The only that we still remember are those ones we can see at the golf course. Now Kibra, as people believe, is... uh, Some people believe that it is uh, the biggest slum in southern Sahara, but uh, to me as a Nubian, this... I don't believe this is our homeland that it used to to feed us. Kibra is now an informal settlement. Many people know it as one of the most famous slums in sub-Saharan Africa, though it is not the biggest, as many believe. Around 250,000 people live in a space of around 550 acres, a little over two square kilometres, or a bit bigger than half the size of Central Park in New York City. The houses Twilib is describing are mostly made of mud and wattle with tin roofs. Some are more permanent houses or apartments made of a kind of cinder block brick. The contrast between the green of the golf course and the brown of Kibra is pretty stark. The air feels decidedly cleaner when you cross the road toward the golf course. Over the past 10 years or so, Some roads have been paved, but there's still no piped water, no sewerage, no formal electricity. Nonetheless, the place is vibrant. Youth clubs, sports clubs, small businesses, churches, mosques, community halls. There is a buzz to Kibra, 
and it has a real Nubian flavour in Makina, the little sub-neighbourhood, if you like, which is the Nubian heartland. When today's ethnic Nubian community first arrived here, around 1902, this was a forest. They had been soldiers in another part of the British Empire, in Egypt and Sudan. By the time they arrived in what would become Nairobi, they were the backbone of the colonial army, the King's African Rifles. The British called them the Sudanese at the time, but they are now known as Nubians. Around the time of independence, it didn't seem right to still call themselves Sudanese. Kenya was home. So they drew on the word Nubian, which referred to the ethnic identity of their commanding officers when they were still fighting for the Egyptians. They became Muslim under those officers and developed Kinubi language, a kind of Creole Arabic. <laughs> This is the story of the Nubian struggle for a secure place to belong in Kibra and in Kenya. Mze Yusuf explains that Kenyans largely live in ethnic communities. Oh, and Mze is Swahili for old man. It's a title that shows respect. People belong to one area of the country or the other. And uh, it is generally accepted that the land in those particular areas belong to them. In other words, to be Kenyan, you have to have a place recognised as your ethnic home. But in an urban situation like Nairobi, which is the commercial hub of East Africa, it's grown to become so big. If you do not own land in Nairobi uh, by way of uh, ownership of a title deed, then you have no right to that land. You cannot develop it. You cannot uh, pass it on to your children. Uh, in, in, in other words, government can decide to do whatever it wants to do with that land at whatever time it wants, without so much as notice. Neither the British nor after independence in 1963, the Kenyan government, would recognise the Nubians as Kenyan. They've been in a tricky spot, unable to make a home in Sudan, having not been there for generations, but also unable to establish themselves as Kenyans. Without a place to call their own, the way Luos have Nyanza near Lake Victoria, or Kambas have Ukambani, for example, the Nubian community isn't always seen by other Kenyans as legitimately Kenyan. We are actually not known or recognised, because when we are in school and you tell a person that I'm a Nubian, they first ask, OK, who are those? You know, So um, it is a tribe which is not so much known by the people. But in their minds, there is not a shadow of a doubt. We as the Nubians, we believe that we are, Ke- we are Kenyans. In fact, we are Kenyans because the Kenyan state found us here. I'm Sam Ballerton crimes an Australian academic researcher. I've worked with the Nubian community doing research on issues of political marginalisation for more than 10 years. In this episode, I talk to Nubians living in Kibra and ask, what does this history mean for Nubians and their relationship to other Kenyans? and their relationship to the British. What do they feel the British owe them? I met two young Nubians, Hassan, who had recently graduated from university, and Aisha, who is still studying, at Makina Mosque, the biggest mosque in Kibra, and a meeting place for the community. The green and white painted structure is the biggest in the area, but it looks like a normal brick building until you get close. There is a car wash out the back, some kiosks selling snacks and soda, and usually a rabble of little kids running about on their way to and from the madrasa, the Islamic school. You can't walk past here without greeting and being greeted with assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. My name is Hassan Mahmoud. My parents have actually been born here in Kibra 60 years ago, so I am sure we have actually been in existence in Kenya for 60 years now. My name is Aisha Said Ibrahim. Um, so I think my family has been in Kenya since... My, my father was born here, that is 50 years ago. Hassan gave us an example of the kinds of issues the community's past can raise. 
So when I told them I'm a Nubian, a good friend of mine is called Deng. He told me, you're the people who betrayed the government of the day because you decided to work with the British. And somehow it, it gave me some some weird feeling because this is someone who knows our history and then says, you people, instead of working with the government, you decided to go. So somehow they took us as uh, we betrayed the government of the day or the systems put in place by working with the British. Did the Nubians betray other Africans by working with the British? Most Nubians don't see it that way, or at least it's not that straightforward. Aisha explains about her forefathers. I have mixed feelings about that. One, I think I'm proud <laughs> being part of the history. And uh, the other part, looking at it, um, being an African and a proud African in that matter, I feel like um, they somehow betrayed other Africans. I think the Nubians were great warriors. Even before joining the army, we are told that if you looked at a Nubian gentleman, you'd know that this one can go for fighting. And why is it that you think the British needed warriors here? Okay, uh, during colonization, we had communities who resisted the colonization. So the British wanted reinforcement, people who will help them fight those communities who are resisting them. But the Nubian story isn't just one of colonial complicity. Now, the Swahilis say Damo ni nzito kuliko, kuliko maji. Damo ni nzito kuliko maji. Blood is thicker than water. As much as you go, you work with the British, your brother is still your brother. At independence, many Nubians sided with Kenyan nationalists, Africans who wanted their freedom including Jomo Kenyatta, who would become Kenya's first independence president. He is referred to by Kenyans simply as Umze. The story goes that they housed him in Kibra, hiding him from the British when he was fighting as part of the Mau Mau, the resistance movement. And so having Umze being housed by people who were collaborating with the, with the British was by, its, by itself showing, yes, we are doing this, but to some extent, one of us must still be protected against any, any harm. So at some point, we can't really say that the Nubian community were confused. They already had a vision for themselves, but they also had their own principles on how things should be done. Mzee Yusuf, who we heard from earlier, told me a bit more about his family's history and his memories of growing up in a military community. I spoke to Mzee Yusuf about this in his home. My name is Yusuf Ibrahim Diab. I am the son of Ibrahim Diab. That's how we name ourselves. Diab was my grandfather, and Ibrahim was my father. Like other Nubian families, uh, it is uh, my grandfather who came from the Sudan and moved. It's a long story through East Africa to Kibra, eventually. Uh, I also happen to be secretary of the Kenyan Nubian Council of Elders. The Council of Elders looks generally after the welfare of the Nubian community, not only in Kibra, but all over Kenya. To get to Mze Yusuf's place, you take a turn off Kibra Drive, the main road for traffic, down what looks like a walking-only path, muddy and potholed, with loads of kids running around. I've been here I don't know how many times, but I still need someone to come find me on the road. New structures are built so frequently that if you're away for a few months, you can't recognise these little roots when you return. Despite the state of the road, Yusuf's extended family have a couple of cars parked in the tiny space outside his gated compound. There are always some daughters or daughters-in-law who greet me with a warm smile. I reach out to nudge their wrist with mine, the way you greet someone in Kenya when their hands are covered in soapy water from work. They bring sweet, spiced Nubian tea and sweet biscuits, and we talk. There's this, you know, conception, or rather misconception, I should say, that Nubians were closer to the Europeans than, than the local Africans. It was not because they looked down upon other Africans. After all, the area we came from was also just like any other part of Africa. But I think some of them were polished by the military service, 
And if you look at some of the pictures that were taken in the 1930s and uh, even late 20s, uh, you'd not be able to distinguish between them and the gentlemen in London or any other parts of Europe for the type of dresses that they put on. So perhaps uh, our standards are slightly higher than the, the standards of the local people. It is not anybody's fault. It is just uh, a question of getting accustomed to certain type of living. As well as dressing well, the Nubians paid less tax than others and they were governed with military rules that were less restrictive than the rules for other Indigenous communities. The British treated them with a respect they didn't show others. They thought the Nubian soldiers were brave and loyal. And they were. Yusuf shows me a photograph of a plaque at the nearby Kibra Primary School. In memory of the gallant loyal service rendered by Sudanese soldiers who died for the cause of East Africa in two world wars and whose descendants will be taught in this school. The Nubians are deeply proud of their military history. The plaque is a place they take many visitors to show how much the British appreciated their service. Along with photos, medals and stories, it is one of the ways in which younger generations learn about the significance of this past. My uncle Ibrahim Dolbit was a soldier in the British Army and fought in Burma. Uh, my paternal uncle Abu Zaid also went to Burma, together with other uh, people of their age. Uh, and for the Nubians at that time, the military was the thing, was the in thing. Uh, and in fact, close to Kibra was the Bula camp, the present site of the Kenyatta National Hospital. And to the north in Langata was another military camp, the Langata Barracks. So, so a lot of uh, people who are, still in the, who are still in the military. And uh, it was a common sight to see military vehicles around. Uh, Kibra was at that time very sparsely populated and families knew each other. And the wider Kibra was a very cozy community. Everybody knew each other and we had, uh, we did a lot of things in common. Uh, weddings and uh, funerals and uh, other social occasions uh, were collectively arranged or organised and everybody participated. You're hearing a wedding procession, much like what Yusuf is describing. This one passed by Makina Mosque when I was recording for this story. And you can probably also hear the motorbikes, tuk-tuks and heaps of other people passing by. The period Yusuf is talking about was something of a golden age for Kibra's Nubians. Very different to this. Less crowded, less noisy, much more peaceful. The land was quite different from what you see now. And there was a lot of greenery in Kibra. There were streams, very clean water, uh, encompassing the whole of Kibra. Uh, we had the Quite a bit of uh, forestry area, wild fruits. We had a lot of fruits in our garden here, the backyard. We had a, a lot of uh, trees, eucalyptus especially, because our area happens to be close to a river. It was a bit swampy and the eucalyptus was good for drainage of the water. And uh, like other um, young Nubian boys, we went wild sometimes, we went uh, hunting birds, rabbits, and such small animals. They had the best of both worlds, a peaceful and green place to live, and access to all the amenities of the city. Other Africans didn't have this. 
they had to have permits to live in the city and they were only granted if you were working for the colonial government or a white family. At independence in 1963, the Nubians had to choose which side they were on. I was a very young boy at the dawn of independence. I was 13 years old, I'd just finished uh, primary school. Mzee Yusuf was coming of age at a pivotal time in African history. The British and other European powers had colonised almost the entire continent for more than half a century, but it was becoming clear they couldn't keep this up. Their moral authority was eroded by the horrors of the war in Europe. They were broke. And European citizens were beginning to wonder if colonialism might not be a bit racist, having seen how racism works up close. At that time, there was a lot of, just before the Second World War, a lot of uh, activity was going on in Africa, Algeria and uh, other parts of Africa. The Sudan itself, uh, many parts of Africa were clamouring for independence and uh, Communication was not very good, but the communication did reach people and they became more enlightened. And uh, there was the realisation that uh, uh, we did not get our worth in terms of uh, compensation. And that uh, the soldiers, with some of whom they fought in the military, were better rewarded than, than them. There was the question of race, of course. Uh, the white race were predominant in many of these things, in world affairs at large, in technology, even crude at that time, but, but they had the guns and they had the means and they had the education and they had the organisation. Africans from all European colonies fought for the Europeans during both world wars, but were not celebrated or compensated the way European soldiers were. But... Europeans had sown the seeds of their own demise. African soldiers from different ethnic groups and nations became more conscious of their own oppression and formed alliances with each other. And you know when you have a, a confluence of people, you have exchange of ideas and people came back much more enlightened. And they, there was that realisation that uh, it is time to, to seek independence for Africa. The Sudanese soldiers and their families had to work out where their place would be in an independent Kenya. Earlier, just before the Second World War, there was a clamour for proper compensation or return to the Sudan. Of course, the official answer was that uh, it is not quite possible to take anybody back to the Sudan now. Even perhaps the Sudanese government would not want you there now. Uh, the irony is that it is the British who are the rulers in Sudan and as well as in Kenya. So they wanted to maintain them here for a purpose. The British government wouldn't allow the soldiers and their families to make a home in Sudan. In any event, they were many generations removed by this time from their Sudanese ancestors. And the British weren't quite ready to give them up as a security resource in Kenya either. The British failure to look after their Askaris, their soldiers, meant the Nubians had nowhere else to go. So... When the agitation for independence in Kenya started, their sympathy lay with the locals. As Mze Yusuf explains, Nubians collaborated with Mau Mau fighters and other members of the Kikuyu ethnic group who dominated Mau Mau. Kikuyu lived amongst us in our houses. They would be dressed in kansus or traditional garb so that they would not be identified as, identified as Kikus but as Nubians. Uh, this was um, a military zone, more or less. There was all, uh, I think when I was about six or seven, you would have a British military troops actually knocking on your door at any time of the night and walk in and inspect and see whether they are strangers or Mau Mau for that matter in the house. It was um, not an interesting, uh, rather not, not a pleasant thing to, to, to remember, but uh, that's the kind of uh, atmosphere in which we grew. The Nubians had to overcome the sense that they were on the side of the British. Being 
legally looked for to fight against the legitimate rights of the people. Even some of the Kenyan community were also against us because they thought we came with the British and that we should go back with them. Independence came in December 1963 and Jomo Kenyatta's new government had to build a nation from more than 40 pretty fragmented ethnic groups. He inherited a bunch of unresolved problems from the British, including the Nubians. New administrators came and all of a sudden it dawned upon us that uh, we did not have any say on the land and it was government uh, that had a say on the land. Technically illegal squatters, the Nubians had no rights to build or repair permanent structures or to stop other people building on their land. They had a say as to who would uh, repair their houses and who would not repair. I remember at one time when my grandfather wanted to repair the old house, he had a brush with the the law and he was stopped and but he went to court and I hired a good lawyer at a, quite a cost at that time, won the case and was allowed to proceed with the building of uh, a then uh, not permanent but actually semi permanent structure. The administration allowed people, mostly non Nubians, but also some Nubians, to illegally build semi permanent structures and use them for rental income. In exchange, the officials would get kitu kidogo, or something small. Within a few decades, the place became a slum and Nubian families had lost their homesteads. Our own plot, by my estimation, must have been about two and a quarter acres or so. And uh, we had a bit of vegetable gardens here, trees, and open ground and a lot of space. But uh, the rush for building and the maladministration, I would say, we were surrounded by many, many houses built by people whom we knew nothing about but were just forced upon us. And uh, the situation is now pathetic. In our next episode, we'll hear more about the dramatic contrast between the Nubian community's standard of living then and now. And as you can probably imagine, there's a lot more to this story. So we'll talk to some other Nubians about how this has all impacted on their lives in Kenya today. This episode continues into a second part, which can be found on our feed. The Welcome podcast is based in Nam, on the unceded lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. Nam is more commonly known as Melbourne, Australia. This episode was produced by me, Dr Sam Ballaton crimes with production assistance and interpreting by Raja Bilale Osman. It was recorded in Nairobi, Kenya. Script supervision and editing by James Milson. The music composed by John Bartley. And special thanks to Mze Yusuf Diab, Mze Ali Yusuf, Mze Ahmed Adam, Mze Swale Abdul Qadir, Mze Twalib Mohammed and the Kenyan Nubian Council of Elders, to Aisha Saeed Ibrahim, Hassan Mahmoud and the Nubian University Students' Organisation, to the Nubian Youth Council and to Samuel Juguna, Sahara Abdi, Callum Sanderson, Tim Gilbert and the Imams at Makina Mosque. If you like this show and haven't already, please subscribe, rate and review on iTunes or wherever you listen to us. It helps spread the word about the show and we really appreciate it.